Um, our next speaker this uh, this morning uh, probably needs even less uh, introduction than Fina did. We, we're talking about uh, Albert Luvera, um, currently uh, competing in uh, rally driving in the World Championship, the Spanish Gravel Rally Championship, the Rally Cross World Championship, and the Dakar Rally. He has collaborated with uh, NASA, so <laughs> we're talking uh, about uh, an international authority here. As an orthopedist and a graphic engineer, he works on designing devices to customize and to adapt uh, driving systems. He also has an orthopedic supplies shop. His beginnings as an elite sportsman were in the world of skiing, and at the age of 17, he competed in the 1984 Winter Olympics in Sarajevo. A year later, in 1985, while competing in the European Skiing Cup, he suffered a serious accident that caused a spinal cord injury and left him, left him paraplegic. Shortly afterwards, he moved to the United States, where he competed in the Paralympic basketball team that were world, world championship runners-up. In 1987, Albert made the move to motor, race, uh, motor racing. He took part in quad competitions and later in the Catalonia Speed Championship. In 2001, he transferred to rallies, driving for Fiat, and competed in the Spanish Rally Championship, both tarmac and gravel, and in the World Championship, thus becoming the first competitive rally driver with a disability. In 2010, he returned to the World Championship driving a Fiat Punto Abaf S2000, an adapted vehicle with which he could control all the functions with his hands. After two years competing in the World Rally Championship, he returned to Spain and after a couple of years began to compete in the Dakar Rally. In 2014 and 2015, he competed in the, in the Dakar with the French buggy team. And in 2016 and 2017, he was signed to the Czech manufacturer Tatra and competed in Dakar in a truck. Another challenge in which he achieved a very good ranking, number 24 in the general classification. His experience of overcoming personal challenges is recorded in the documentary The Wings of the Phoenix, directed by José María Borrell, which premiered in 2005, and in the, books, in the book No Limits, which he published in collaboration with Jordi Cantavella in 2011. And I think uh, we're going to hear much more about uh, No Limits, uh, uh, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Albert. Okay, thanks a lot. Maybe you come in to work with me to the manager. <laughs> I don't have a manager. <laughs> uh, bon dia, muchísimas. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the organization for thinking about me. Um, they contacted me with FINA in order to start a little bit and to tell you a little bit what has happened to me in life and where have I found my support in sport, really, in order to overcome what has happening to me in life. And this is, uh, I would like you to link also to your own lives because the, uh, the overcoming in sport is inside us and what happens to us in life, well, we can just turn it and take advantage of such um, you know, inconveniences that happen to us, obstacles, and we can take advantage of them in order to, well, instead of becoming like paralyzed, well, um, trying to make the most of them, right? The word, the ideal world would be attitude. So, first of all, you'll see that I don't have much documents. I'm a bit of a disaster here. But, I, you know, I've just realized, thanks to you for having made me come here, because I've just realized that it is necessary for us to keep archives. But I'm telling you that 
40 years ago. I'm, I'm going. I, I'm, te- I'm going to tell you about 40 years of sport. I mean, I started quite a long time ago. And perhaps the document I have is from the arrival of the Internet. It's just a pity because I like a lot of information that would be very, very powerful. And I don't have it. First of all, I'm going to show you a video, uh, a two-minute-and-a-half video, which is the trailer of a documentary that was made about my life, which was very successful and that it was nominated to the Goyas and then there was another, a longer documentary of one hour for Channel Plus, Canal Plus which uh, had a big, you know and well I'm just going to click to see if if I can start A ver si si la, la gafo Lo explicaré aquí fuera. Mira, ahora, perfecto. ¿Qué sonido? Ya, yo creo que es lo que nos hace fuertes. This is what makes us strong. Well, I remember the accident as a terrible blow because we were all very young in the last uh, trial in Sarajevo where I was descending. So at the arrival, uh, um, judge crossed me and the blow was terrible. Well, he was fighting because he thought he had to. when Albert had uh, the accident, well, doctors told him that he couldn't have children. I think that is something that needs to re-educate, we re-educate, and what we feel about them, about uh, handicapped people which show us great victories greater than the ones that we might be able to obtain. Well, now I can do things that the rest of mortals can do. Well, he's nice, pleasant, very enthusiastic. For me, I insist again, he's an example, he's a model, he's a role model. Nobody knows how it works, how the, the wheelchair is going to, has to be used, how to go up or down. We have never abandoned our bodies because the quality of life is very important and we have to continue working on it even if time goes by. You have always trust that sometimes there's going to be some research that's going to have a good outcome and your body has to be ready for it. Well, well, I'm going to tell you a little bit what has happened to me, and I can tell you I'm from Andorra. I've always been very much involved with sport in Catalonia and Spain, but I will tell you why. <coughs> I'm part of a family of four brothers. My brother, I'm sorry, my father was all very uh, an athletic man. He, he played soccer until he was 80. And when he was 80, he used to stretch himself and he, he even played. And I think that the culture of sport was inside me from a very young age. 
my brothers were very good skiers but they had a clear idea of wanting to study and go to college and I thought well I mean they do it so well and why would they like to study but um, well I mean I was more inclined to sport and at home we had a serious problem because I didn't have a very good behavior well I mean I I was like you know kind of a, you know the silly th doing silly things and you know this kind of thing I was the one to stand out always and well I was starting to ski and to get into shape and to get fit and the problem I had is that in Andorra there are only four schools so I got transferred from one school to the other because I was not unwanted and but I started skiing and then I started participated in a, in a race that is called Topolino there are like um, four or five per year and there's one that really uh, makes a difference where there were like around 300 or 350 children boys and girls and the winners of this contest are the, are the ones who might go to world contest or Olympic Games so I could participate in three or four times and the second time I met the people from the Spanish team and one of these well, the time the head of the coaches of the Spanish team and they, well haven't you thought about devoting yourself to skiing well I say I don't know I mean I like it very much but well I haven't at that time uh, um, you know my hormones were like making the most of me and I didn't have like a clear horizon it was not very clear to me yet so I was when I was expelled from all schools in Andorra my parents thought about sending me to Bilbao and I was there like for yeah, two, two, two months I was also expelled and when we were <coughs> you know my parents were desperate and well they are have, they, they, my parents are kind <coughs> And they said, well, why don't you go as instructor or something like that? Instructor. I had never thought about that, to work as instructor. <coughs> and I said, why don't we talk to the Spanish Federation? And what they offered to me, because the coach of the Spanish team told me, if you ever want to devote yourself to skiing, you could come and study and train with the... <coughs> Junior team, which is in Vieja, in Vieja, and I thought, well, that's not a bad idea. La forma i ens em vam namals mos pares a parlar amb ells i la cosa va ser molt bona i llavors la Federació Espanyola es va ficar en contacte amb l'Espanya, amb l'Andorrana i va ve un entremig entre els dos i la Albert se'n va anar a estudiar a a Vieja, a aquest col·legi. Tu ve començar a entrenar, s'aproximava l'hivern i els meus entrenadors estaven supercontents amb mi, a més portava un tipo de pushing a dintre de l'equip que durant el rest de la meva vida doncs, també l'he anat portant al rest de, dels equips inconscientment, que és aquesta gota llatina divertida i, i, i perquè tothom estem molt concentrats a dintre per fer un esport, però eh, sempre trenco una miqueta els molles aquests de, de una miqueta més de diversió. No? I a la, a la mesura que s'aproxima la temporada el, els entrenadors de l'equip espanyol van dir Albert coaches of the Spanish team said Albert, we're going to start training we're going to start competing but um, you you're not going to race why? you're not going to run because you haven't passed any exams and you have to start um, you know putting on your batteries but you hadn't told me that but this was the occasion when I just didn't study a lot but I was in class I changed my attitude a little bit and well sometimes I tell children about that and well mm, between being on standby and you know paying a little bit more of attention you can just pass your subjects so the intelligence is inside their inside so I started passing the exams and my parents thought I was even copying no 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 I told them I don't copy and I'm not stealing exams or anything like that I just doing it right and my coaches started to support in me 
and I started playing well, participating in the season. The season, well, the first uh, picture photograph I have is from 1995, which is a bit well. This photograph here, because the next ones are from the Olympic Games. I was very young, and I was, you know, a bit um, and. I was a bit restless, but at that time I continued to be as restless. But I started to develop this the south hemisphere to learn things, and it's not so difficult. I mean, I tell uh, boys and girls. I mean, we have you just have to make an effort, a small effort, and then it will be useful for the rest of your life. So I was happy enough or fortunate enough to start skiing really skiing, I mean real ski, and to participate in international championships, and then we had to decide whether I was going to compete for Spain, Spain or Andorra, I decided to, for Andorra, because my family is from there, I could have both citizenships, but I started, you know, skiing with Andorra, and then we, we would compete at the European Cups, at the International Federation of Ski, which are some type of races where, well, I mean, I think they are like tennis players where they stayed um, for two or three days with my mates. We would compete for two or three days in the same place. And we were just like for one month and a half or two months out of home. And then we stayed home so we we say we are fiseros among us and then we started participating at the european cup and then some world cup we participated in the world cup and we started at the world championships which um, the world cup is every year the world championships every two years and then i was fortunate enough to to go to the Olympic Games, to be selected to go to the Olympic Games. This was my teammate. We are we were two. There were like mm, six or seven managers, and we were like two athletes. This happens sometimes. This is the great. Uh, how fortunate! How come I went to the Olympic Games? And these are like these opportunities in life that I want you to understand. You have to take advantage of opportunities. Why did I go to the Olympic Games? Because I was from Andorra. If I had been from Austria or from Switzerland, I would have never been to the Olympic Games um, being 17 years old. <clears throat> but this is like you have to make the good reading. When I got there, I just hallucinated. I mean, I was flabbergasted. People were clapping at the opening ceremony and they said, well, I mean, they don't know me at all. I mean, there are 50,000 people here, you know, clapping their hands, um, cheering me. So living in an Olympic village and eating, having meals with your idols, this is something that really charges your batteries. So I left the Olympic Games by speaking to my coach and telling him, well, when I'm back, I want... I want uh, and to go back to the Olympic Games, not because I am from Andorra, but I just want to compete with the good ones. I want to be here in 40 years. Out. I mean, and he told me, in four years' time, you're going to come back here, but you're not going to be a rival for the best ones. I said, no, and maybe in eight years' time. If we, but I said, okay, even if it's in eight years' time, I just didn't want to be an instructor or anything like that. I just wanted to be an Olympic skier. I don't want to be a coach. I just I'm I'm, I'm going to do something else. I mean, I will play another sport after after skiing. And well, that's that's how it went. But here you can see, um, well, the Olympic uh, uh, all the politicians. You know, when you go back from the Olympics, this is like quite common. Even if it's from a small country such as Andorra, it happens everywhere. Uh, Olympic diploma. This is one of the little things, one of the things that I keep with great appreciation. This was like a, a very important step in my life. 
so the school of of the Spanish team changed me as a person and I started studying and the Olympic Games changed my mindset as a sports person I mean after the Olympics I had become an athlete and I wanted to be a professional of skiing of sport I mean in principle of a, a, a ski professional unfortunately next year in 1985 during the last races of the season on the 15th of March of 1985 I was participating at the European Cup in Sarajevo in Yugoslavia in the first place I had been for the Olympic Games and it was a super giant and at the final line it was um, it was raining it was very foggy it had been the the, <coughs> the test was um, had been delayed for a day so I was like about to evolve and I made a change of personality I was very very strong we had been training for two years very heavily and I felt like an, a different Albert much taller much stronger and thanks to that the impact was less important than when I see I mean you see that I'm quite like run down but I don't look bad so the accident was on the final line the arrival line and I just got into the egg position and at the finish line and I was like you know lowering my head in order to win those and right at that time uh, a judge got up the man was like um, two meters tall and he was 130 kilos and he just crossed the finish line at the time when I was crossing that line so the impact was really strong many many things broke all my ribs from the left side I mean many bones the the shoulder uh, so the sternum by half I mean from the impact so my body opened and this you know the strongest bone we have in in, in our body when, when you break an arm or a leg or something um, but this the, the breastbone broke or the, the sternum so all this thorax is the only part in our body that can not that that we need it constantly all the time in order to breathe so men also have another part that is never <laughs> without movement but this part this breast so it broke the breastbone broke and also my <laughs> spine so if I do like this I, I I fall down because I don't have abdominal I don't have um, you know my, my muscles don't work and mobility I'm, it's not only mobility but sensitivity that has been affected with all all, all what it implies at the level of incontinence sphincters control uh, erection etc you'll see that I also was happy that in a time when there wasn't Viagra or Cialis, I had to the to do some training. I have a, a girl, a daughter, and I think that the mind is stronger than we think. And if we support ourselves in our brain, you know, you know, I it took me six years to have a control of erection and to ejaculate. But I think that our mind, our brain, is very powerful and can make us achieve many things so with this accident from Yugoslavia I was mm, uh, carried to Barcelona I was in a hospital for a time at the Clinica del Remey I I stayed there five or six days and then I was transferred to Bayebron in Spain you have three very important hospitals which is which are Vallebron, Goodman and Hospital Nacional de Paraplégicos in Toledo and I think that this is like um, one of the countries where 
at the level of the um, spine, spinal cord, um, which has a very, very high level. And when I was at the Vibram Hospital, well, then I will be very fast because this is all I have because I will talk about <laughs> cars. So I was visited by three doctors from the US, from the NASA, and I make a profile. I have a profile they are looking for. They are looking for young athletes with a um, spinal cord lesion. And if I wanted to go to the States, and I said yes. Why did I say yes? Why did I accept? Because I thought that I was going to live from my legs and my legs stopped working when I was 18. So this is quite a blow. How do you overcome these things? You overcome these things with three points. One is oneself. When something like this happens to you or something like similar that could happen to you in life, you have to see some lighting in the tunnel and you have to enlarge this light because you are the most important point. I know that it looks, it sounds selfish, but I think that that's what it gives the idea of moving forward. The second is family, your family. I have a great family. We don't uh, call each other every day. We just occasionally, but we love each other. And well, we don't need to call each other every day. Mm, well, no, we don't need that. Well, and the third pillar, the third pillar, which is very important, which I also insist on friends, are friends. I have my band, my, we were seven friends, now we are five, two, you know, were left, uh, died on the way, one in a, in a skip, well, in a snow problem, but, yeah, in an avalanche, but, well, we, we are more careful but I think that they have also taught me and I've also taught them that we make a, a, a kind of a illegal family pack among the five of us. And in 1985, you have to think that there wasn't, well, there were any drums, any fucking drums anywhere. So if you were in a wheelchair, I mean, it was like the transition of people with disabilities to, to what society that we wanted to just be present in society. And at that time, I was fortunate enough to have this illegal family. And well, let's go and have dinner. And there were 15 stairs and they're all, oh, we wouldn't complain. 15 stairs? I mean, they took me uh, with them and they carried me out and we continue having our party. So it was not a problem, but it wasn't a problem because we were as we were and I was, I had their help. And this is an advantage and sport. These have been like the most important things together with family because I've been able to move forward. So what happened then? I went to the States and I had another opportunity apart from the NASA, which I didn't like very much, but we were working there. It was very nice, very pleasant. Well, no, it was kind of unpleasant at times. And I was very much concerned about so instead of staying in Houston because I didn't want I was sent to Virginia and I liked Virginia very much well where I had um, Charlottesville which is the Virginia University and I was there with Dr. John Jane who is the second most important neurosurgeon of the world we became very good friends I would um, gave, I, I would like um, imbue him with some kind of Latin life or way of life and then he started working with Christopher Reeves Superman so the two of them became really famous then and I had another great opportunity there I met some people and they told me if I wanted to play basketball basket I mean I don't like basketball but well these are like this life opportunity once in a lifetime opportunities so I started playing uh, with the team of Charlottesville and then I had the big opportunity of, be, of of playing sports again. I had become like kind of, you know, bored. I hadn't given up, but I didn't know what to do. So I started playing basketball. I mean, I didn't like basketball, and I still don't like basketball. But I, I found like some kind of 
you know, feel for it. And I understood something. I mean, within the world of disabilities of Paralympics, this is something, well, I, I, I fight against them because everyone has medals and everyone has many things because there are like 300,000 categories. So I don't think there's more professionalism because everyone gets a lot of awards. And I think that it should be more restricted. And I'm telling you that which, and I have a very serious injury. So what happened with basketball? Of the five who are inside the court, the addition of these five has to be 12 points. And I can tell you which are 12 points. Someone who has um, tibial amputated uh, three points and I only have only my arms and I don't have um, balance I account for 0.75 so I have more opportunities to play because I just don't bother the other four who might have like their muscles and who are I mean they can just rip my head off they are much quicker than I am but of the four mm, well, I was of 0.75. The one who was like more active, uh, it was me. And I started playing for many minutes. And the thing is that I was quite good. So then the NBO, you all know what it is. I mean, we played the WNBA and we were like <coughs> seconds. And it was very, very good for the whole team. And we had a coach, uh, a man and a woman with the woman I was um, you know I had a very good relationship but the coach the male coach didn't want me to go out every night so we were at the international finals in Canada and we got to the final we were second in the world so I didn't like basket and you see what I mm, achieved uh, so this is something um, that for me it meant that taking advantage of opportunities when they show up but well, then I thought that Andorra, I mean, I like Andorra much more than the US. So I decided to go back in Andorra. I stopped uh, studying um, graphical engineering, graphical engineering. And I came back here and I started working at an office, at a studio engineering office. But I, I felt that I like some fun, I mean, like drawing, electrical systems or security systems, and the most exciting was like a swimming pool, I think. So I thought that there was something missing in them. And at that time, my mother, as a good mother, she is, as a good mother she is, she gave my pushing, she, she said that I had to heal. And she, went, she took me to all the healers in the world. So I just travel like 70, 60 or 70,000 kilometers. And with this 60 or 70,000 kilometers 30 years ago, we didn't have like the roads we have today. We didn't have the policemen. policemen. So every time I was driving faster and I was realizing that that thing I liked was carrying it with me and I was I, I was feeling safer every time and at Andorra we have the privilege of that when the winter comes we have these Gran Valera parkings and we made our own circuits and well 10 or 15 people um, joined together and 4 or 5 would compete and we were like racing our uh, um, and in the middle of winter, we were uh, just, well, skidding and thinking, well I, well, I also want to compete. So then I went to the Federation and I went there and said, listen, guys, I would like to have the license. I mean, the license of what? The license for racing? Well, I mean, I would look at you. <clears throat> no, no, but I, I want to compete. And they didn't say no. But they didn't say yes either. But... And then we were working the Andorran Federation, the Catalan Federation, very, very strongly. And what did I do? Uh, it took me two years. For two years, I was going there every day to the Federation. Albert, well, we've also already told you that we're going to call you. Yeah, but you're coming here every day. So 
they were like really irritated in Barcelona and in Andorra. So it was like, well, you know, I was just passing by. Well, I mean, you're passing by every day, you know, come on. I need to know something, I insisted. So um, they also got to know that I was like driving faster every time. Why did I fast faster every time? Because... Because ski with motorsport is is related to to ski and motorsport. Skis are like the tires that we have in a car, or the suspensions are the knees, and the vision is the same. The sight you are you are just checking on the next curve and the next curve, and three curves ahead. Otherwise, I would just bump into it. So it is very similar. So I made a kind of mix in order to move forward. So I got the license. I got the license in 1989. This is like the medical, um, um, the medical file, which looks very old here. Because and I managed to obtain a license for the first time in the world, a handicapped person could compete against the normals in all sports. If you had a disability, you played a Paralympic sport, or you just stay home. So a barrier was broken here or overcome. Someone who was had a disability was going to compete directly against the normals and this was just because I was like insisting so much so what did I do in 1989 I decided um, where would we go to compete with what car and what car was it it was a Peugeot Peugeot why a Peugeot because it's the it was the Peugeot cup here we have all the licenses the Catalan license the Spanish license this is something I'll explain afterwards. In 1989, 1991, I competed with this car in the Spanish Championship at the Osona Rally. And this was very important in 1989. And I started with Peugeot because it was a promotion cup. All the racers were competing with exactly the same car, a car that couldn't be changed and this make had special prices and, we st and I started to look for sponsoring and I've always been my own manager, my own secretary, I've always done everything for myself with the help of my friends but I've always done things by myself and I started racing at this Peugeot Cup and at half season I realized that we were number six, number seven in the classification and my partner, the co-pilot said, when are we going to start racing? We are racing. He said, no, but racing properly. When are we going to beat them? And I said, look, hey, we are now half season. If we'd had any accidents, then we could have said, that's why we're not running so fast. But now we can start running fast. And we went to the podium from the 7th to the 12th race. And in the last one, when there was just one race left from the champion, we were just one point away from the champion. So in the last race, whoever would win, would win the whole championship. I mean, you didn't really need to win the race, but one to beat the other one, the two rivals. And do you know what happened in the last race? Well, we did win. And we did win the championship. So this is me in my wheelchair beating everybody. And that was an extraordinary change, not just for people in general, but for me, because this opened up a great door for me. I started competing even more here, you see. From 1989 to 1991, this is from 1992 to 1994, I wanted to start doing something really big at a national level. I didn't have too much support from Peugeot Spain, but I met Beth Bases from Big, who was the Spanish champion at that time in rallies. 
and in the year 2001 he was the head of my team and he introduced me to the Renault people who said that they would support me in circuits not in rallies I said well let's do circuits and here you can see the car and all the dashboard and the shift and everything and I'll tell you more about this because in my life it's all been about overcoming situations and the evolution of controls what do I mean by that when you have a disability with my evolution I have been opening up a very important new field one of my main sponsors is Widow Simplex that has been sponsoring me and has been working together with me it's a family company a family business Spanish and Italian and it's number one in the world in adaptations in adaptation systems and I will give you more information afterwards here you see my gears I accelerate with my thumbs and I have a brake on the right and in the circus in the gravel races when I'm on the fifth gear I have to brake I have to go down to fourth gear and the car goes like this and then you're in the gravel circuit everything goes towards the front and then I lose some milliseconds so we started working on the control panel with this system on the left so I can be holding with my left the wheel then I can reduce shifts and then I have the clutch the clutch that's here a button on the shift and in this way I can be using the clutch and that's what I do boom 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 all this has evolved all these control panel all these instruments and from 1995 to 2000 I was a privileged racer at Citroen. Citroen created this Super Cup ZX car. There are only 25 units of this car and it ha used to have 200 CVs and back then it was like a speed star you couldn't buy it it was Citroen who would choose their 25 racers 25 pilots it was a beautiful period of my life I started to have mechanics and engineers working together with me and this is this you can see these controls in the car that are absolutely beautiful we started working with the electronics and we started to do things with the pot with the potentiometer as if I was playing with uh, toy cars with these electric toy cars and and I would and I I had my mechanics preparing everything for me and water palin and a Nissan racer who would say to me I don't know how you are able to drive this car because it's so complicated and it's true it's complicated and this is what I use for two years and I have to say that it was a tough time at the same time but do you know who benefited from this all the disabled because from these car models from these controls there was then the possibility that people with an injury because my injury is in the back in this area and two three four five in this vertebrae just five centimeters above that you start having problems with your hands in fact during the first two months after my accident I couldn't move my left hand like this I couldn't do this because I had this very big inflammation and I on the back of my neck and I couldn't move my hand like this and when you see people on the street with their hands like this well it's because they have this kind of injury and instead of having this mechanical acceleration where I had this handle well we went from pushing like this to pushing like this and this is an, like an electronic system like the Scalextric cars and it didn't work at first for me but it did work for the people on the street with disabilities so this opened a new door for society because those of us who have a disability can have their own cars 
and in this way we can have our wheelchair inside the car and this gives us so much freedom and so much autonomy and it, that, that's absolutely priceless because if not you always need people to give you a ride to dinner to the library to the sports center wherever or you need someone to give you a ride all the time whereas in this way we're free to be able to move from one place to another here we see the evolution of the Citroen car and I started uh, to go up and up I had won the championship here that's why there's this number one on the car and I also did some karting these are my friends in and this is the, the last Citroen car that I drove and I was very privileged to be with Citroen for such a long time the only problem was that every time they would call me and say congratulations you've won another championship in Spain I said but you're not happy and I would say no I'm not happy and he would ask me why and I said because I don't really like gravel circuits and he said but you win yes but I don't really like gravel circuits I like rallies I want a rally car I wanted to go back to the rallies because it's not just a question of winning it's a question of enjoying yourself it's a question of having fun and uh, the uh, gravel circles everything's so perfect it's like the English people you know it's like uh, you just accelerate and you break whereas in rallies there are so many other obstacles the dirt the night time and obstacles you find on the road you start sliding the so I prefer the rallies I prefer the rallies to the racetracks and in 2001 2002 I started working for Fiat and I'm still with them with Fiat and I went to the rally world championship so that's me you know after getting my last my li license for being so insistent i got to the world rally championship and and this is me this is my co-pilot mark we are now professionals <laughs> and this is the Catalonia Costa Brava rally between Vic and Lloret this is the world rally in Italy in San Remo it was spectacular from 2004 to 2005 I had the possibility in 2004-2005 I had the possibility of participating in two international races and clearly Raziona. He used to be an F1 pilot who had an accident. He was extraordinary. You have this film that's very uh, famous with Nick Lauda and James Hank and he was a Ferrari racer. So he was a myth. He was Swiss he's not Italian he was an island he is a German Swiss so he has his bad temper sometimes and both of us wanted to get this license and we did this together in 1989 and we did it together I did it in the Latin way and he did it his own way he said that it was an obligation for the authorities to give him the license but he didn't get it at first but I did get it because I was always very insistent but he always felt very grateful I was always a bit faster but he was always there but he was already 60 or 60 something yeah he was about 60 and and he would get tired after two laps but anyway we I really enjoyed being with him it was a privilege to be with him because we always got many sponsors when we were together because he was very well known and he 
always he was always very very good to me, very very good to me. He had a bad temper, but with me he was always great. In two thousand four, two thousand five, apart from competing, we went to the national. Championship. It's just a question of making the most of what you have. If they want you compete, it doesn't matter whether you're in the world championship or the national championship. We started competing at the Spanish national championship, and we usually reach the podium. You can see how we always have fun inside the ha the car. And I also did the Mo the Montmelo 24-hour race with the Codon brothers. They had won three times, and we had to withdraw just a few hours before the race finish. And the head of the team always says, "What are you doing here at the Dakar, or what are you doing at this 24-hour circuit? Because racetrack, because." You have never been conservative, and and here you have more photos. This is also a Fiat car, an Abar, and we used to get to the podium. And in 2007, and Sukru, a Japanese make car make, they called me. And they said, "Look, we are from Isuzu. We've been following your your records, and we'd like you to go to Dakar." In fact, I thought it was a prank call. I thought it was my friends just calling, but it, we really thought it was a prank. And the Isuzu people were saying, um, "Don't you believe us?" And I was like, "No, no, I, I really don't believe you. I really love the Dakar, but I've never been in this kind of race, and I really didn't believe that an official team would be calling me." And Mark Wallen was. A champion, and then I also was with Oriello, and I was there with them. And I thought, "Oh my God, this is really a prank. This is not true." But it wasn't a prank. They had been following me at the Finland Rally, where I was number ten, and they thought, "Well, this guy is a cool guy, and he's fast, and we like that." And why am I explaining this? Because this is another opportunity that I had, and I went to the Dakar Rally. It was the last year it was held in Africa, in Mauritania. The Isuzu, my Isuzu, broke down. Until that point, though, everything went very well, and for me, it was a wonderful experience. Here I am with the Stilofino. And then I received another call that was just before the Dakar, and Miss Tsubishi called me also to ask me whether I wanted to go back to the Rally Championship. And of course, I said yes. But first, I had to talk to Fiat. Fiat said that if it was just two races, then yes. So I went with Mitsubishi, and I did so well that they paid for a third race. Here I am in the World Championship, and in 2001, 2002, and I first went. To the junior championship, and we became great friends, and this friendship continues with love. And after he went to Dakar, we met at Dakar. Now I'm at the Rally Cross World Championship, and I have a book called No Limits. And he wrote the prologue. Here we have some more photos. Here you have the shift. Instead of having a button here, I have a trigger, so that I have more sensitivity. And we have all these systems and wheels that are adapted. And this has been an important evolution. Here we have this other rally, the Canary Rally, where we also won. And and here I started to win by myself. This is in the Azores, 
and the other island was Madeira and every year we've been we've been very successful in 2010 I went with Abart to the rally to the world rally and I had seven races in 2010 and I even went to New Zealand I never thought I would go to New Zealand and I did go and this was very important because my parents had never been to any of the races. My mother didn't want to know anything about the races and my father had been twice. But as she loves traveling, I said, look, this year I'm going to New Zealand. So will you come with me? And she said, well, if it's New Zealand, yes. And well, she enjoyed the atmosphere and she never thought that was the way it went. She so how everything was done and well she started enjoying the races here we have Germany France Mexico here in Mexico we had a before and after because for the first time in the world I had this classification for the world rally championship and in Mexico we were, were very popular and well as I'm disabled well <laughs> they do help me a lot and well we also had lots of fun together here I just started to turn around with my wheelchair anyway this is Portugal and we did really well in 2011 we came back here you have the president of the International Federation who started to get interested in my successes at the RAG rally that was a great party I'm one of their drivers and now People are just more used to see me on the podium. These are the photos at the end of the race and that's the price because a rally doesn't last just a minute or so 15 minutes. It's three days. So at the end of the three days, you have a very intense experience on the limit all the time. They're very long races and very tough physically and mechanically this is what I have inside my car I remember Carlos Sainz once coming with his engineer here and giving me the thumbs up and I was thinking why, uh, why, why is he saying that and then he said where, where, where are you going oh it wasn't the thumbs up he was asking me with his hands where are you going with all this stuff are you traveling around the world or what and he said is this a race car what is it and he was amazed about all the things that we have in the car because I mean the weight is so important and of course I have the wheelchair in here and we have all these controls and we have like three people in the car the weight of three people instead of two people you know <clears throat> and 55 kilos 55 additional kilos in the car is a lot of weight you know you have to drag all that weight when you brake when you accelerate and it's important to organize all this weight properly here we have the rally in Sardinia in Jordan in Jordan we also reached the podium this is one of the <coughs> best successes and it was great great fun this is the Spanish championship in 2012 this was absolutely beautiful to have someone with a disability winning a rally and my rivals were thinking oh my god you know because you're skidding all the time in the rallies here you have more photos let me just show them to you really quickly and we also celebrated things very well and that's important it's very important to celebrate things to have fun to enjoy ourselves because it's as I say very important in 2014 thanks to Qatar I 
during the years I was competing, we I became great friends with Nasser Abatiya from Qatar. He's a prince, but he's very friendly. And in 2012, when you started working with the Olympic Games, I was lucky that my daughter, in 2012, my daughter went to the Olympic Games. She was 16. She went to the London Olympic Games. And Nasser called me because, apart from being a pilot who has won the Dakar and many other races, he called me from there. And he's also... He's been an Olympic champion three times. He has one Olympic medal that he got in London and two diplomas. And he called me from the Olympic Village and he said, Hey, Albert, how are you? I said, Hi, Nasser, how are you? And he says, I'm sitting here next to a beautiful blonde who says she's your daughter. And he said, Are you sure? You're my idol. Really, you're my idol. Because when we were with Loeb Loeb and Sober, he would say, you are world champions, but you're not Olympic athletes. Albert and I are the only, only Olympic athletes. And I said to Nasser, well, I'm coming to London to see my daughter run. And there... That's where we started with the idea of going to Dakar 2012. I wasn't able to go in 2012, 2013 because of the budget. In 2013, I didn't have the budget either for Dakar. But the, my, my friend Nasser said, I'll give you this money and then that money. And then Qatar allowed me to go to and he would say, I cannot understand how your country is not paying for you to go. And he would get angry with my country. And I said, well, my country does its own things, and I do get some sponsorship, but not enough. But they really don't know what you represent for people with all the things that you do and with the way you are. And I was like, well, I don't know. Well, in my country, we're all like that, you know. <coughs> And I did go to Dakar then, and it was great. It was um, a good experience. I mean, not everything was perfect, but I really liked it. And in 2015, we went back. The team bought this car, and I had to, and I did two races in the World Championship. And I said I didn't like the, uh, to, to, uh, to do that type of race. I preferred to do the Dakar and other races like that, the rallies. But I wasn't someone who did the range type of races. Here's the Dakar with Alex Aro, who is with Nani today. And it's a great experience to go there. And in 2016, do you remember that Mitsubishi called me for two races and Fiat gave me authorization? Well, Renegard is the head of the Tatra team. He's the coordinator. He called me in 2016, in 2015, and he said, Albert, aren't you going to the Dakar? I said, no, because the boogie make, that's the make with which I did the first two, that we're going to the Africa race, that's the old Dakar and he said, would you like to go to the Dakar and I said, well it depends, what does it depend on, I said, well it depends on the car, if it's a good car, okay and he said, it's a truck, a truck a race truck, and I said oh yeah, of course and he said, I knew it I, I suppose you've never driven a truck, and I said, of course not, and of course, in Europe, the disabled don't have a truck driving license. I don't know whether it's because we're dangerous or what, but they don't allow us to have a truck driving license. And I come from a small country, however, where things are done that are necessary to prove to the world that you can do things. And I had the opportunity of being with a great team with a wonderful truck. 
and one of the most successful things on the social media was do you know what a Belgium and Andorran and a Czech do in a track together the Dakar race so that was one of the jokes that you would have on the social media and it's not at all usual to see a disabled person such as me to do some things because for example I use uh, a kind of anchor that you use for climbing is like a harness so every morning we would at five o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning I would always have to hear look here's your uh, harness although it looks like a speedo and they would give me that harness that was like a g-string and I would well get into that harness and here we have all the adaptations in the track and this was also an opportunity because as I said before I never used to like basketball but I started playing basketball and we were at the WNBA and we were sub-champions, runner-ups and when an opportunity comes by you have to really take the opportunity and enjoy it here we have the Tatra team 52 people make up the Tatra team and it's really amazing to be with this huge team they're very happy I've already raced twice with them they call me every year in fact they called me last week and I said well this time it's going to be complicated because after 2017 I needed an operation on this article on this joint here because I have no cartilage and I have uh, um, also and I had another operation <coughs> here um, because this is the thumb I use for the clutch and uh, first uh, when I got to the finish line my mechanic would say do you know how many times you've pressed the clutch this time and he would say 3200 or 3700 almost 4000 times you've pushed that clutch and on the seventh day it was like please don't tell me because my fingers and my thumbs look like uh, big sausages and I started to have physical problems with my hands my hands would start to swell I had arthritis and also my hips I was having trouble with my hips because I have no abdominal muscles and I started losing bits of my teeth because you have all these bumps when you are driving with a truck and you start flying you move your whole body moves every time when you fly from bump to bump and it's there is a speed limit of 140 but we're talking about a track with 1000 CV uh, look at our faces here this is how we arrive and it's all great fun but it's also tough tough we're talking about dust and dust over dust that look at us here before and after before after you know that's the difference this is at the finish line and well that's about it in 2018 we are here we change specialty and we started fighting against the Scandinavians because there aren't any Latins in this specialty where there is a lot of adrenaline and we're talking about sh 
short races. They last five, six minutes, but you do lots of them. You had five, six cars at the same time, and the racetrack is just one kilometer with all kinds of surfaces. You feel like a gladiator. You have 20,000 spectators, and you're competing down there in the racetrack. And it's very important from the first second till the end, everything is so intense, so, so, so very intense. And you only use one type of tire, and, and it's uh, road tire. This is my engineer, this is my mechanic, the controls. And this is the handbrake and the shift. The handbrake is in yellow. And you have this trigger, this lever, and you have the handbrake. And this is how I control everything with my little finger. And then the car starts going whoa, whoa. So you're skidding all the time, and it's great. <coughs> And I just want to say one thing. Now I'll show you the last video and I'll just say two more things. I hope you enjoy it because I love this video clip. There is nothing that's impossible. And this is my story. You'll see. How can I? have the video clip on the screen, please. Maybe you can help me, the technician can help me get the video clip on the screen, please. I know you're feeling hungry, I'm, I'm hungry as well. La arrastro, potser? No sé què li has fet. Mira, està oberta aquí, però és aquest d'aquí. Què? Sí. They say that I'm brave, that I don't know any limits, and that I'm looking for happiness in the short term. But they overestimate me. I've been afraid. I've lived in hell. I've seen the limits of life very near. Too near. Albert Llovera, Olympic skier, participating in Sarajevo 1984. There was an unfair accident that moved him away from sport. But he never gave up.
unpredictable and beautiful. My daughter Christina is everything in my life. My dad is the best dad in the world. My dad is the best one in the world. Life goes very quickly. Or maybe I'm too slow. Albert is a pilot at the Rally World Championship and he <coughs> competes against rivals who have no disabilities. Olympic Games 2012, London. His daughter Christina was classified to compete in athletism. The legend continues. The Olympic spirit remains intact. Albert does things that mortals just can't do. Albert cooperates in some research initiated by Christopher Reeve. He gives conferences all around the world and he gives hope to whoever wants to give up. Princess Diana of Wales was one of his supporters. To conclude, I am not going to change now. I'm not going to become tidier. And it's a pity because there are many records that I don't have. And I cannot explain from when I was a child and not even when I was in the Olympic Games. I do have a few more photos than the ones I've shown you, but there are some images of what I have achieved, of what I've done, but I can tell you that I live in the present, and I really don't keep too many things. When I left the Goodman Clinic, I was lucky that Dr. Frankel said to me, Albert, we love to have you here with us and that you're going to Houston now with the NASA. It's been a pleasure to have you here because you've taught us a lot. And I said, I've taught you a lot. And he said, yes. And he said, enjoy life. Enjoy life because you're going to live 20 years. And I said, ah, 20 years. And that was 33 years ago. And he said that I would live 20 years because back then that was our life expectancy. And do you know why? Because the family was taking so much care of us that we wouldn't really do things and we would just rot in a way. And I do agree though that there's no need to go to the Dakar or do things like that. But it is important for us and for you to be active, that we can enjoy the things we do, because we are here on this world by coincidence. If our parents hadn't got together that day, or, well, then things wouldn't have been the same. I wouldn't have been born in my family, but in your families, okay? so. You never know, you know, my sperm was just quicker, and that's why I'm here today. But if not, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. So enjoy life, have fun, and thank you.